We all know it. We all love it. Analog horror is often most praised for its visuals, followed closely by its writing, depending on the series. But without sound and music, a lot of the trademark tension that makes the genre so memorable and exciting would be gone. Horror movie soundtracks have been staples of the genre since its inception, and some of Hollywood's most iconic sound bites, Jaws, Psycho, come from horror scores. As I've rewatched a lot of my personal favorite analog horror series, I've come to realize how integral the soundtracks truly are and how important they are to the success of the overall series. I don't really see it talked about that much, so I wanted to just go ahead and talk about it myself. If you're new, hello, my name is glitchwitch.jpg, but you can just call me glitchwitch. I talk about internet horror, ranging from analog horror like today, digital horror, creepy pastas, internet urban legends. Sometimes I dabble in survival horror. Basically, I just dabble in Silent Hill. <laughs> analog horror at the end of the day, though, is my most favorite thing I talk about. Um, some of the subject matters I feel like are done to death. So I try to mix it up and not do too much analog horror all the time. But videos like this allow me to talk about a lot of series that I like that I think are very saturated in the YouTube video essay market. And to be perfectly honest, like, smarter people than me have made more compelling, you know, standalone Mandela catalog videos and stuff like that. So I like to find an angle. <laughs> and with that being said, I do want to clarify, Anthony Fantano, I am not. I am not a music critic. I casually am a music enjoyer. I play the banjo very, very beginner level very beginner level. I look like I play the banjo today, don't I? I don't know what this yee yee moment is, but I'm feeling it. I don't know. It just felt right. <laughs> I woke up and I chose this. It's not at all because my roots are growing in and I didn't want you to see the harsh <clears throat> light blonde line in the middle of my head. So I do want to get that out of the way. I am not uh, going to sit here and tell you like music theory. I am just really want to highlight some of the musicians that have helped make some of our favorite analog horror series so compelling and successful and simply because I just don't think it's talked about a lot. Uh, I will say I love soundtracks and scores. Peter Gabriel is my favorite musician of all time probably and like a good chunk of that is because he did the score to The Last Temptation of Christ which is my favorite movie of all time and I just love that score. I've always loved movie scores, stuff like that. So, you know, I think it's it's cool that analog horror has um, grown and continued to the point where like, you know, one of the examples I'm gonna talk about today literally has like albums upon albums of full on sc scores. And I just think that's cool. And I think it continues to legitimize the genre. Oftentimes, analog horror is kind of disrespected as a medium, similar to a lot of the things I talk about, like creepypasta and things like that. Because it's published online for free, it's not respected as much as a TV show that airs on television or streaming service or a movie that comes out in the theater, similar to creepypasta, because it's not published, you know, in a book or by a reputable publisher, it's not taken seriously. And of course, there's some stinker analog horrors and some stinker creepypastas out there that you know, don't need the level of respect that movies and TV and books get. But there's certainly some really standout incredible work that I think is often undervalued simply because of the format it is presented in. So I think um, bringing on these musicians to these series helps just round it out into more of a to be perceived as more of a full art form, if that makes sense. I'm going to split this video up into two parts. I'm going to talk about the use of like currently existing music and sampling music and then I'm going to talk about like fully original scores um, because both are heavily utilized within analog horror and I think it's just easier to tackle it that way. So let's start by talking about existing and sampled music. Without a doubt a trademark of internet creation in general is utilizing royalty free or non-copyrighted materials, 
whether that is sound or visuals. A lot of analog words creator base is younger people who do not have the money or the resources or the connections to produce you know, original music. This is kind of the logical way to go and it's what I think you used to see more or it's what you see in the beginning, like the infancy of a series and then it kind of expands from there. The key to this route of creation is to curate the right music for your project. So let's start off with a patented glitch witch favorite, the Mandela Catalog. It's my favorite analog horror series. I love it dearly. And Alex Kisser, the creator of the Mandela Catalog, pretty much fully relied on utilizing existing non-copyrighted music up until volume 333. And, you know, it was mostly older recordings of famous songs like Ave Maria and the Battle Hymn for the Republic. We are currently receiving countless reports regarding unidentified hostile organisms that we will refer to as alternates. I will say, as much as I just said, this is my favorite Animal Horror series, I'm like at a point where I've seen it so many times I'm like picking hairs. I do think that the earlier choices don't resonate as much as some of the later curation choices in the later original score uh, complements the series. I think it, it gets better as it goes, which is how anything could be. I think that the very like Americana sound bites from some of the earlier episodes just don't fit the vibe of the series as much. However, I do think that one of the greatest needle drops in an analog horror series ever comes again in volume 333 and he uses the oldest known recording of Amazing Grace and I can't hear this anymore without thinking of the Mandela catalog. It's like fully integrated into my brain because it's such an impactful song in that moment. Like I think that like Ave Maria and stuff like that it's almost it, you would think the religious you know songs would almost feel too on the nose because of the nature of the series but Amazing Grace plays at 333 when it's at peak tension uh, Lieutenant Thatcher Davis is desperately trying to save his partner Ruth Weaver and it's just it, it hits the spiritual note in the right moment because at this point our protagonist Thatcher does not really know what's happening and the inclusion of this song reminds you as the viewer like this is bigger than everyone involved in this it goes way back and you know, I think it just hits right in the moment and it makes the threat of the alternates and of Gabriel feel bigger than they ever have. And I love that needle drop. I just...
So while some of the earlier Mandela samples maybe are not my favorite, I love, 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 love the Amazing Grace needle drop. And don't worry, we'll talk about Mandela catalog more later with original score because that's where it truly shines in my opinion. Moving on to another iconic series and one of my other favorites, the Monument Mythos. I have Mr. Manticore here. Would you like to say hello? Should I? Can you fit under my hat? Okay, we'll see how long that lasts. Probably not long. The Monument Mythos has a full, full, probably the most comprehensive original score of any analog horror, which is by the iconic analog horror composer AJCW or Andrew Wilson. It, he, it, we're gonna keep talking about him. He's, he's not gonna go away. He's going to be an integral part of this <laughs> episode. We have multiple uh, composers, but he is the one that, that he crosses over into other series. Mr. Manticore's falling, so I'm gonna put you back, buddy. Mr. Manticore is the creator of the Monument Mythos. This is this is him. This little this little man right there created the one of the most compelling pieces of fiction I've ever seen in my life. Besides the score that Andrew did, there's also remixed versions of existing songs that really just ugh. I love them. They're so like iconic to the series. Andrew Wilson is involved in one of them, so I'm just gonna start talking about it. In Washington Wonderland, uh, one of my favorite episodes of the Monument with those, it just breaks my heart. <laughs> I would love to make a video about the entire Virginia Arnoldson arc of the Monument with those because it literally, like, I, if I talk about it for too long, I will start crying. Like, it, it really hits me. And the music is a big part of that. So in Washington Wonderland, we hear the normal unedited version of James Pastel's Heavenly Dream. plays in a moment where it's just a very vulnerable moment showing what has happened to Virginia and how the uh, events of this series have truly ruined her life but also given her some of like the greatest gifts she never would have gotten if the events of the Miami Mythos hadn't happened. It's very difficult. It's a very difficult situation. This song, Heavenly Dream, to me is the theme of the Monument Mythos. It is what I think of when I hear this song. I listen to it regularly because it makes me think of the Monument Mythos. And this song is always closely tied to Virginia Arnoldson and her family's involvement in this series. So this song makes two other appearances in the score and both times um, that it appears after Washington Wonderland, they're remix versions by Andrew Wilson. First is in the trailer for season three. And this trailer is interesting in general because at this point, fans didn't think there was going to be a season three. Season two ended with such a definitive ending that it was kind of a shock to even get a teaser for, for more Monument Mythos. In this trailer, there's a very, very distorted remix of Heavenly Dream 
that Andrew Wilson calls Virginia Skies. And this song is the central focus of the teaser. It literally begins with lyrics on screen following the song. And then it fades into the phrase, for dad, for you, no one is gone forever. I mean, like, it gets me. This trailer makes me cry. It's like 30 seconds long. Virginia Skies is the definitive Monument Mythos Heavenly Dream because it, it reaches that like warped kind of almost uneasy sound but still feels very lovely and bittersweet which I think is what the Monument Mythos is at its core. It's this difficult to follow, difficult to engage with, but also painfully human and emotional story and I think that this song really just encapsulates the entire feeling of the series in just one you know five minute song and then last the song appears again on a fully instrumental track called Virginia Sunset Heavenly Dream which closes out Freedom Forever which at that point had been assumed to be the finale of the entire series and the ending to this video hits the same emotional highs that Washington Wonderland does, but it's a lot less sad. It's it's a lot more bittersweet than what we see in Washington Wonderland, and this remix of this song, Fully Instrumental, hits that kind of hopeful, beautiful feeling that you get at the end of Freedom Forever. I just think it's a really smart choice to kind of keep that in as Virginia's theme because as much as the series has continued and Virginia and her family has appeared again later, that to me is the ending of the Arnoldson arc as I perceive it. The Monument Mythos is a very dense series that I sometimes struggle to connect with with the later stuff like the Monument Mythos Modern Day. So to me, it's just a beautiful ending to what I think is maybe the most well-written arc of analog horror ever. I just love it. I will make a full Virginia Arnoldson and Arnoldson family video at some point because it's just it's so good. And then much later in the series we get another new theme song I would consider it. It's it's kind of funny. It's <laughs> it's Total Eclipse of the Heart by Bonnie Tyler which I would have never expected to be in a no monument mythos video but I would consider this it's a remix of the song by an artist called vague 003 and I would consider this the theme of monument mythos modern day which I kind of personally consider a completely different series than the first couple of seasons of monument mythos but 
we'll see. Mr. Manicor likes to shift things around in like what occurred in what order and all that stuff. So who knows? I'm going to wait to see till it's like concluded what he says and maybe follow suit there. It first appears in The Monument Monster. <laughs> And it has the same like level of distortion that we saw like with the Heavenly Dream song, but it feels way more sinister and un unnerving, which is kind of how modern day feels to me in general compared to earlier seasons of the Monument Mythos. So I think it's a really smart choice. I love I love the use of existing music, but like really claiming it. <laughs> as your own like it feels like it belongs to the series now the last one that i'm going to touch on and again I, this isn't like a comprehensive list these are just ones that have really stood out to me there's certainly more music in analog horror that i'm not going to discuss today if i discuss the music in every single analog horror series we would be here for hours <laughs> the last one that i'm going to talk about as far as like utilizing existing music is angel hair which is a animation based analog horror series by the mangan sisters that i have discussed before on my channel it's great the soundtrack for Angel Hair utilizes mostly older songs from like the 40s and 50s and 60s and it really establishes the nostalgic feeling that I think is so integral to Angel Hair. Sorry, Gabby. I was scared you'd be mad at me, but I shouldn't have lied. No, you shouldn't have. It hurt my feelings that you would take one of my angel feathers, but it hurt me so much more that you would lie about it, Francis. Will you ever forgive me? The Bible tells us to forgive, but Proverbs 19 also warns us about the consequences of lying. Do you think we should forgive Francis now that he's apologized? We should? 
That's very nice of you. It shows a lot of courage to be merciful toward others. And it's just a nice kind of through line throughout the whole series. And another thing that I love that they do is they upload like mega playlists to their YouTube channel with um, songs that were featured in the series or songs that like fit in the vibe of angel hair that you can just like listen to. So sometimes like when I'm working, I'll just throw that on because it's fun. It's it's good. I, I like that they do that. Now I am going to move on to original music. When you see this in a series, it, it feels like the production is just together more. It feels more comprehensive, more complete. That's not to say that series that don't have original music are not still really compelling and interesting. I'm just saying it usually happens as a series continues to grow. And, you know, in some cases, Monument with those, not necessarily because Andrew Wilson's kind of been there from the start. But um, my first example going back to the Mandela catalog, it was definitely something that came along later. And I think in general, the series grew and the music edition was part of that. It wasn't the only thing, I will say. <laughs> One person is kind of responsible for it growing <laughs> and he might have written the music. <laughs> so like I said earlier, the series started to get original music just a little bit in volume 333, composed mostly by Thorne Baker with additional songs by Alex Kister himself and even a song by Andrew Wilson. Uh, so like I said, Andrew Wilson has crossed between Monument Mythos and Mandela Catalog, so I would consider him like the guy for Analog Horror Score composition. Andrew's song for 333 Repass is pretty consistent to the sound he has in Monument Mythos, but it, it fits the tone of the Mandela Catalog more. It's a little more ambient and subtle than what we hear in the Monument Mythos, which I think fits the series. I think Monument Mythos just demands kind of a more bombastic score. It's okay. What's wrong, honey? Everything's gonna be okay. There's no need to cry. Hey. Hey, what's up? You started crying again. Same time, I don't know what to do. I'm sorry, I, I, I just don't know how to help you anymore. Are you absolutely sure it's not the- No. No, I, I keep telling you, it's not. I've had it unplugged for weeks now. I mean, I guess I can come over and help you figure it out. Are you free tomorrow night? Tomorrow night? You promise you'll actually come over this time? He's still your child too, you know. I swear to God, Lynn, if this is just an imaginary friend or something, I'm gonna lose it. What do you mean? Do you realize how young he is? I think that there'll be so, it'll be so overpopulated that there'll all be wars, all nuclear explosions and everything. So I just tend to today's chores and let the good Lord worry about tomorrow. But what about us? We'll always have Paris. Speed hundreds of telephone calls as well as television programs. The real meat of the original score in Mandela Catalog is from Thorne Baker, who plays Lieutenant Thatcher Davis and is the main 3D artist for the Mandela Catalog. So he came on triply for volume three through three as an actor, composer, and animator. And I don't think the series would be where it is right now without him. Like him and Alex work really well together, and I think he has just elevated the series tenfold. I'd say what you will about <laughs> Thatcher Davis being played by like a 23 year old man. He's supposed to be 44. The animation and the music can't be beat. So we gotta give it to him. So his songs for Mandela Catalog are very ambient, dreamlike, and a little unsettling sometimes. And I think they fit the vibe of the series perfectly. Like it sounds like the perfect auditory accompaniment to Alex's very 
weird visuals. Like, no one makes things that look like Alex Kister. I can't, like, quite put my... I can't quite put it into words, um, the aesthetic, especially going forward, like, volume three and volume four, when you start to see the more live action stuff. It's just such an interesting look, and I think the music perfectly fits that. My personal favorites from the original Mandala songs by Thorne are Afraid of Your Own Reflection, which feels very Silent Hill. Uh, so props. We, we stand Akira Yamaoka <laughs> in this house on this channel. This is Lieutenant Patrick Davis. Seems like I made a mistake. Everything's clear here at the station. Calling off all the units. Over. And Dear Ruth, which is really just this very less unsettling song and it's more just kind of beautiful and sad and bittersweet which clearly is my flavor of analog horror i like when it makes me cry dear ruth i know you can't read this letter so i guess this is more for my peace of mind i miss you a lot man <laughs> I like to think that you're watching me somehow, making fun of me while I write you this fucking letter. But I'm always greeted by that same invasive silence. I keep driving by the house like uh, I'm gonna get over it somehow, you know? But it hasn't gotten easier. There's a lot of movies and <laughs> music that you missed. I wish I could show it to you just one more time. Cause the reality is, Ruth, I don't think <laughs> I'm going to find another friend like you again. <laughs> and every day it hurts. <laughs> it hurts so bad. <laughs> and now you're dead because I was too fucking scared. <laughs> I was too fucking scared. <laughs> I'm so sorry. You deserve better, Weaver. You really did. I'm a huge fan of Thorne Baker on the whole. He has a music project called Teenage Disaster that's like his main thing. And it's such a like the score for the Mandela catalog is such a different side of him musically because Teenage Disaster is like really heavy and loud and even like kind of like silly at times. So it's cool to see his range. Love to see it. This is like a drinking game. Every time Glitch Witch mentions the Mandela catalog, take a damn shot, you'll die. Now we're gonna go back to the Monument Mythos and our boy Andrew Wilson. We have a different, very different original score from the Mandela catalog. There's, first of all, there's more. <laughs> and it's, I think it's the most comprehensive, I think I already said that, of any analog horror soundtrack. There's just so much music. There have been three full albums put out that you can like access on Spotify or on Andrew's Bandcamp. And it's one for each of the main volumes of the series. And I just love these score these songs because Andrew's music perfectly re reflects just the weird, discordant, and like bombastic nature of the monument mythos. I don't think the series would be the same if you removed the score. I think it really is it, it adds to the chaos as much as the visuals and the, the writing does. And of course many songs fit into the more like subtle ambient territory that you're gonna get pretty much with any analog horror soundtrack. But there are certainly standouts that really shine and really elevate the respective videos. The first one that comes to my mind and the first song I think of that's original and not Heavenly Dream for Monument Mythos is Clinton's Decision, which is like the main track featured on Suez Canal Crab. 
which is an insane video, one of the most horrific in the series. It's so freaky and weird, and the song just, ugh, it adds to the tension and anxiety of the events happening within that video, so it's just hats off, so good. I think overall of the three albums, the score for volume three stands out the most for me because it has that bittersweet sadness that it clearly is the special sauce for Glitch. And that's where Virgin Skies is from that soundtrack. So you can feel that throughout it. Tracks like Side 5, Best of My Mirror, and Alone No More, which is composed by Ember, not Andrew Wilson, convey the tragedy and the triumph of season three there's so many big events happening in season three and it feels like such a conclusion to a story that I think a lot of us grew very fond of and very characters we were very close to and I just think that the music brings it to a whole nother level and makes it a whole different experience
I mean, Monument Mythos, it just has the most robust and film-like soundtracks of any analog horror. There's just so much, and there was so much time put into it and so much effort to get it to match up with the series, so I just love it. I, I think having that much dedicated original music really does wonders to shape the story that's being told and flesh out the world that's being built, and I think Monument Mythos has one of the most well built worlds in any analog horror. You just believe it. So this one's gonna be a little different for me <laughs> because this is a weird one. This is a series I quite dislike, but if I'm talking about music in analog horror, I cannot ignore it because the music's really good. And that would be Urban Spooks series The Painter, which is not one that I have shied away from criticizing on this channel. Speaking of not for me, Urban Spooks the Painter. I hate this, but it really does have some of the best music in the genre. Like I have to recognize and give credit where credit is due. I don't want to be the type of channel that just blindly hate, you know, hates every aspect of things I dislike because there are absolutely elements of this series that are really good. But the, it's the plot and the presentation of the series that I take issue with. It feels gratuitous and edgy to be edgy for no real reason. But the music is what makes it actually scary. I think the music is the only thing that is consistently terrifying and upsetting and feels real. Like it's real horror, not forced. Right from the, the beginning, in the first video, Faces, the music is just the driving force of the tension. It, it builds throughout the whole video. There's like a constant droning that it starts with, but then like the melody starts to build. And oh my god, if mainstream horror movies could take a note out of this guy's book because 
it just really, it's super effective. Urban Spook himself is the composer. You know, he does everything by himself. He writes it, does the paintings, edits, and does the music. And the music is present throughout the entire series except for Witness, which relies fully on the tape sounds and then the end of me shows like a CCTV footage of the killers, so I, I get why he took the music out. Most of the music is similar to kind of the droning nightmarish vibe that we got in Faces, which isn't a criticism. It fits the material at hand. But in the video Pigs, the music is louder, harsher, and just has more of an impact, which does make sense because this video is considered by many, including myself, to be the most gratuitous video in the series and I would say the one that really had people starting to have a conversation about the intention behind the series. It's just a little much. However, this, the, song, the score in that video is great. You know, I think that Urban Spook is a very talented visual artist and composer. I just cannot get on board with the violence and gore for violence and gore's sake. I don't think it's saying anything and I just really am not a fan. I would love to see where he goes in the future. I hope that he continues to grow as an artist, both visually and as a composer. And you know, I checked out his SoundCloud and like some of his music that has nothing to do with the painter is so different from what we see there that like I'm very interested to see what else he continues to do and I, I hope that he keeps making music because he's very good at it. I will say we're kind of leaving analog horror proper territory but the internet has decided to deem this series analog horror so I'm just gonna run with it. I'm talking about Boysvert. Boysvert is what I would consider more of an experimental animated series than analog horror created by the artist X Remy and the music that x -Remy has composed and curated is like so closely tied to the visuals. They really couldn't, I, these videos couldn't exist without the music. The music is so integral to the entire experience. This music I would say is the most tonally different from the previous examples that lean to more ambient vibes because like the boys for music is basically like nightcore music. It's super chaotic and almost hard to listen to depending on your tastes. And some of the videos literally feel like music videos with like full on like dance breaks. <laughs> like the video Continue, which doesn't have a track by x -Rainy. It's um, by prod.avb. And again, like literally there's dance breaks. It's great. I love it. I love Boysvert. It's something that I don't even quite know how to discuss on this channel because it's so loosely a series, but I mean, I, I just love Extremely. I think he's incredibly talented. We have some of uh, Boysvert original work on our wall in our house. I just, I love it. It's, it's some of the most visually compelling stuff that I've seen and the music goes hand in hand with it. <sighs>
Like I said, there are certainly other examples of great analog horror musical and scores. These are just the ones that I personally think of when I think of music and analog horror. And of course, you know, some of them are just my favorite series like Mandala and Monument Mythos. But, you know, others I think have just really had an impact on the genre. Like as much as I don't like Urban Spook, you know, when I made my video doing the analog horror tier list, that was kind of the consistent thing I saw is that people said they kept watching the painter because of the drawings and the music. So, I mean, I'm not alone in this thought. It's it's clear that it's it's very good. I just think that these composers, um, you know, especially the ones that aren't like Urban Spook, where they, they aren't the creator at the forefront, like, that's first thing associated with this series, I think they deserve to be shouted out. Especially someone like Andrew Wilson, who I just don't ever hear about. Like, I hear about Thorne a little bit more just because... He's more heavily involved in the Mandela catalog outside of music. I didn't even know he did the music until quite recently. It was kind of like a, oh, duh. He's a professional musician. Of course, he did the music for it. You know, kind of shouting out Andrew Wilson because, my God, dude is a powerhouse. So I'm going to link all of these composers, like socials and stuff below, or SoundClouds or Spotify's or whatever have you. Check them out. Check out teenage disasters music it's very fun i enjoy it and let me know other scores that you love in analog horror and uh, let me know if there's anything else you'd like me to talk about i love to talk about analog horror i want to do more kind of specific point of view things like i said i'd like to make a video just talking about the virginia arnoldson arc of monument with those i kind of want to make a mandela catalog video specifically about certain characters so that's kind of what I'm going to do with my analog horror-based content going forward. Whenever something new comes out, like I did a Walton Files for response reaction analysis video, I'll probably do that as they come out. So like look for more Walton Files stuff. As it rolls out, I know Mandela Catalog 5 is probably going to come out this year. So like I'll absolutely make a breakdown video of that just because why not? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not a, I just struggle to um, enter a conversation that's already over when it comes to like analyzing existing episodes. I think going in and looking at specific elements that maybe aren't as discussed is kind of more what I want to do. And not even just from a storytelling perspective, more even from like a production perspective like this, like making this kind of makes me want to make one about sound design because sound design goes hand in hand with, you know, the soundtrack. Uh, making just a fully fleshed out experience. So we'll see. Let me know your thoughts. Let me know what you want to see from me. I'm open. And thank you so much for watching. Yeehaw.